James Stiglitz is a Nobel Prize winning economist from Columbia University. And he wrote an article, Lessons from Argentina's Debacle. So we're going to look and see what lessons uh, the Nobel Prize economist derives from what's going on in Argentina, even though we know things that he doesn't. And at the end, we're going to explain why I should be getting a Nobel Prize in economics for my miracle equation and why it should be the last one ever awarded. Joseph Stiglitz wrote in Lessons from Argentina's Debacle, Argentina's collapse incited the largest default in history. Seven lessons must now be drawn. Seven. Wow. <laughs> Let's see what lessons he's learned without taking into account the new interest-free currencies entering circulation that we know about. Stiglitz. In a world of volatile exchange rates, pegging a currency to one like the U.S. dollar is risky. All right. Lesson one. Pegging is risky. Oh, okay. So he's talking about the federal currency only of the cash rich that has virtually disappeared from circulation and not the new social currency of the cash poor that's taken its place. The interest is only in Fed money and people who deal with Fed money investors who get interest. Stiglitz, globalization exposes a country to enormous shocks. Adjustments in exchange rates are part of the coping mechanism. Okay, lesson two, globalization shocks. Three, you ignore social and political contexts at your peril. Any of the following policies, which leave large parts of the population unemployed or underemployed, is failing in its primary mission. So, if there's unemployment, you're failing. Wow, lesson three. A single-minded focus on inflation without a concern for unemployment or growth is risky. Well, focus on inflation to an economist like Stiglitz, who thinks that inflation is too much money, means that to stop too much money, you must raise interest, which causes unemployment, he admits. So, he's saying that it's risky to cause unemployment by fighting inflation with interest rates. I mean, hungry people riot, revolt. Five, growth requires financial institutions that lend to domestic firms. Selling banks to foreign owners without appropriate safeguards may impede growth and stability. So, selling banks is risky. But if you got no money and you can't afford to keep it without going broke, what are you going to do but sell it? Six, one problem, one seldom restores economic strength or confidence with policies that force an economy into a deep recession. Wow. Having policies that force the economy into deep recession isn't good. Boy, that's new information we'd have never thought about before without a Nobel Prize winner telling us that. Whoa, deep recessions aren't good. And seven, better ways are needed to deal with the situations like Argentina's. So lesson seven is better ways are needed. So this is from our Nobel Prize winning economist. So a top world expert solution is better ways are needed without offering a lesson on any better ways. So I are, so he, he says, I argued for this during the East Asia crisis. What? He argued for them to study the seven lessons? What did he argue for? The IMF preferred its big bailout strategy. Now it belatedly recognizes that it should explore alternatives. I see. He said it should look for alternatives, and they didn't look for alternatives. So even though he doesn't know of any alternatives to look for, they should have anyway. And because they didn't, that's why they're bad. Okay, he says the IMF will work hard to shift blame. There will be allegations of corruption and claims Argentina did not pursue needed measures. Of course, it needed to undertake other reforms, but following the IMF's advice made matters worse. Argentina's crisis should remind us of the pressing need to reform the global financial system. I guess he didn't look in the Millennium Declaration for restructure the global financial architecture, where he would have noticed that it said just restructure with a time-based currency. And thorough reform of the IMF is where we must begin, but he has no idea what that reform should be. I do. Run out like poker chips, no interest. Every chip backed up by the collateral, no inflation. So I go on pressing the need for reform of the global financial system, but no suggestions as to what to reform. 
Lucky they invited me and not Stiglitz to address the United Nations for the Millennium Declaration, where I suggested the Unilets resolution as opposed to his non-suggestion here. And it was passed. Google Unilets resolution. The writer, a professor of economics at Columbia University in New York, big one, won the Nobel Prize for economics last year. He was formerly chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors to the then President Bill Clinton, chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank. So, a Nobel Prize economist with nothing to offer, who is tops just because at least he's looking for better ways, even if he hasn't found them yet. So, while well, most of the economists are just happy with the way it is right now. So, regardless, I found the better way, the let's unilet way. And I say that because of my miracle equation, I over people as I, predicting how many guys get knocked out of the game, predicting how much of their collateral gets seized, predicting how much shift B inflation is going to happen, the true relation between interest rates and inflation, that rising interest passes on higher costs, not lower costs, morons ask any businessman, when they raise the interest rate, are you going to lower your price? No, I got to raise it. Well, they tell us they're going to lower it. Well, they're stupid, and they are. So that's why once you solve the economic riddle that the economists are trying to solve, then there's no more reason to have another Nobel Prize for economics, right? Once it's working right. That's why when I get the Nobel Prize for economics, it's going to be the last one. Once the riddle's solved, what are you going to do? Keep giving guys prizes for coming close once got one guy already scored the bullseye? So anyway, this is the kind of weak thinking you have going on by the top economists in the world while the underground interest-free currencies are actually popping Argentina out of debt. Well, it must seem cocky to say that all the world's economists are wrong and John the Engineer is right, but that's not the first time that's happened. Let me give you an example. In 2003, this is the headline, John Turmel going on Parliament Hill with seven pounds of marijuana to prove at the time that the law was dead, that it had expired, and for two years, the police, the judges, all the crowns, the lawyers, they busted 100,000 people until they finally admitted that the law had been dead for two years and they dropped the last 4,000 charges. I made him do that. Here's a picture of me smoking a doobie in front of the Peace Tower on the hill. The other picture is me being taken away by the RCMP. But finally, there's the article that said they had to drop the last 4,000 charges and admitting the law had been dead for two years. And all the lawyers and judges in Canada were wrong, and Johnny Engineer was right. Well, I can only tell you that I asked them to erase the charges against the 96,000 people who'd been convicted and while the law was dead, and I took it all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, and they hushed it up. And I consider that the biggest crime of the judiciary in Canada. Well, the marijuana convictions while the law is dead, and they didn't erase their criminal records, though they admitted the law was dead. Well, here we have a book, Grace and Mortgage, by Bishop Peter Selby. ISBN 0232521700, worth getting. And on page 117, he talks about John Turmel with the economists in the world who believe that raising interest rates fights inflation. And he says that the comments of Galbraith and Hutton, biggies, illustrate why, although the raising of interest rates is the weapon but against inflation chosen by those who profit by it, it is also clear that as a method it finally cannot work. John Turnell, a Canadian engineer and campaigner against usury, has in two long articles brought algebra, plumbing, and poetry to bear in the task of demonstrating that the move from the piggy bank is not simply a move to greater sophistication from the piggy bank, as it was already described, but a move towards allowing the money supply and therefore the amount of credit and debt to grow inexorably and exponentially, for banks do not lend out their depositors money, they create new money when they make loans. So anyway, once again, all the economists in the world teach that inflation is an increase in the money chasing the goods. I teach shift B that they don't even know about, same money chasing less goods. They believe that to fight inflation shift A, you raise interest rates, and I believe that to fight inflation shift B, you lower them. And Argentina, when they dumped all those currencies into circulation, the economists screamed it would cause inflation, and inflation went down. So all the economists in the world are wrong again, and Johnny Engineer is right again. That's why I'm going to get the last Nobel Prize in economics.